Today's event is a joint effort of the South Dakota No-Till Association, the Mitchell NRCS off Field Office, SDSU Extension, and the NRCS. And one of the first things I'd like to do is uh, thank all our sponsors that helped us put together and provide input and money uh, for today's event. And I'm going to just read through the list. Um, South Dakota Wheat Commission, Farm Credit Services of America, Wheat Growers, Mustang Seed, Monsanto, Prairie State Seeds, Next Level Ag LLC, Millborn Seeds, Lacrosse Seeds, Dakota Best Seed, Agronomy Plus, Farmers Alliance, Mitchell, First Dakota National Bank, C and B Operations in Davidson County Implement, Scott Supply, Crop Tech, Ducks Unlimited, Aurora County Conservation District, Davidson County Conservation District, Hanson County Conservation District, uh, South Dakota No-Till Association, SDSU Extension, USDA and NRCS, and Pioneer Hybrids of DuPont. So, Let's give them all a welcome round of applause. Our next topic is going to be on cover crops, old tools for new systems, and our speaker is John Pike. John Pike is from Marion, Illinois and operates Pike Egg LLC. Pike Egg provides agronomic consulting and contract research services for the egg industry. He is also a cover crop specialist for Zia Mays Foundation and the Southern Illinois Coordinator for Nitrogen Management Research conducted by the Illinois Fertilizer and Chemical Association. He has many other educational and practical experience qualifications and I think he will give us a lot of good information on cover crops and how we can utilize them on our farms and in our systems. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here today. I had to sign a, a release form a little bit ago for the video, and I don't know why they'd want to use me, because I've got a face made for radio. I've been told that many times. <laughs> pleasure to be here. It's the first time that I've ever been to uh, South Dakota. I thought when I uh, <clears throat> was that on my bucket list that I'd come up to hunt or something, not to uh, talk at a cover crop meeting, but maybe, maybe I can do some scouting while, while I'm up here. But glad to, glad to be here and uh, really enjoyed the talks from the first two speakers and kind of glad to know that uh, many of the things that I have experience with as far as cover crop species and some of the uh, rotational and seasonal considerations up here, uh, even though we're different, dealing with a different length of a growing season where I'm at in southern Illinois, uh, the concepts are still pretty, pretty much the same, so uh, we'll, we'll kind of keep going on that, uh, on that track. One of the things that I, I wanted to make to, uh, sure that I did while we were up here is to make sure that my uh, presentation was relevant for the, the region. I know at times uh, around different parts of the country we have some different industry uh, uh, programs that are put together where they have speakers kind of do the, do the road show and I know that in, in my experience in working with University of Illinois Extension and the Crop Sciences Department at U of I running a, a <clears throat> crops research farm uh, in deep southern Illinois, uh, it seemed like a lot of times after those speakers came to the region, my phone would ring off of the wall for about the, the next month with people uh, taking ideas and comments that these folks had and uh, tried to apply them to their farm. And a lot of times when they applied to Ohio, they didn't apply to Southern Illinois or Southeast Missouri. So uh, we'll try to try to keep things general and, and move on. Uh, just a little bit about uh, where I'm from in geography. Illinois is a long state. I, I live down in here uh, in the almost the suburbs of Kentucky where you might uh, think a lot of, a lot of differences in Illinois. A lot of people think of, of Chicago when they uh, think of Illinois. Um, others, uh, central Illinois, the uh, corn and soybean production. Down in my area we have a lot of uh, row crop production uh, <clears throat> but it is uh, smaller fields, highly erodible uh, land, a uh, lot of no-till, a uh, lot of cover crops, need more no-till and more cover crops like, me, like many areas do, but a lot of diverse things though. We've got uh, the Shawnee National Forest, 
a lot of neat places to go for recreation, almost kind of mountainous uh, areas that are in the foothill of the Ozark mountain range. And then uh, also where the uh, Ohio and uh, Mississippi rivers come together uh, has been a traditional hot spot for uh, waterfowl hunting. And uh, on the farm that I grew up on, we, we run a, a commercial goose and duck hunting uh, operation. The goose hunting uh, kind of changed when conservation tillage became the, the theme in central Illinois and has slowed down the migration of geese. Uh, from what it was uh, 25 or 30 years ago, but our duck hunting is, is still pretty good and we're probably only about an hour and a half from uh, northeast Arkansas, so uh, way, way down in there, but a lot, of, a lot of things going on in that area. Uh, <clears throat> just a historical uh, point of view, my family was in the uh, hybrid seed corn business back in the 30s and 40s and into the, into the 50s. That's my uh, Great grandpa and grandma there and my uh, grandpa and great uncle there that were in part of the seed company and I've got a lot of this memorabilia that hangs in my uh, my house and as I was getting ready to uh, pack up to come in here the other day I looked and there was a uh, this was a brochure out of a 1959 seed catalog of my family uh, seed company and there's a, a reference to a, a Feenstra in Davis South Dakota is anybody here from Davis or know any of them there's a, there's a, what's that? It's R R O Feenstra, yeah. Okay, well I'll, I'll be darned. But anyway, I thought that. Yes. <laughs> Hang on, this is good. <laughs> Probably a bunch. I, my my family moved from Pontiac down to the to the end of the of the state uh, when I when I was real little. So I've got memories of up there, but they I uh, I, I don't have any contacts to anybody that's buried in the in the landfill. But yeah, that and it, it's 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 quite a it's quite a monument too because it's very flat up there in that area and you've got this landfill and it, it's probably 150 feet high in some place. It's like they're building a pyramid. So any anyway, a lot of a uh, lot of interesting things there. So that's kind of some some history of, of things. But you know, look at the that's some of the old uh, memorabilia there. But uh, also another thing in the news uh, this this last week down in southeast Missouri and we. Get a lot of our news from southeast Missouri and into Arkansas and there, there's a lot of let's say uh, unique folks down in, in in that area this was on this was on the TV news the other day a guy guy tried to use a combine to pull a truck out after he got stuck in a field and caused sixty five thousand dollars worth of damage so you, you can't make this stuff up but anyway we'll we'll get to the serious part of the of the matter now uh, right off the bat I, I wanted to uh, hit on my uh, take home message. If it, so if anybody wants to go get a Dairy Queen or something else for the rest of the presentation, this pretty much uh, sums it up and I think ties in pretty good with, with what the first two speakers talked about in there. Uh, the big thing with cover crops is developing a system that's suited to your particular environment, uh, cropping systems, the resources and equipment that you have available to you. But uh, you know, a cover crop success in, in my mind and the, with the producers that I work with in, the, in a big region of the of the state of Illinois that have been long-term no-tillers and, and cover croppers, they approach this a, as a system. And they've had very good luck with this thing. It takes time to reach, reach your goals, but the folks that have been successful in these, in these adventures, uh, <clears throat> they, they very much see cover crops as a system and a total new system, much like moving from conventional tillage into a no-till system. And it, it's also been my observation that a lot of the failures that come, uh, that you hear about with cover crop uh, uh, experiences, those failures come about because the cover crop is just seen merely as an additional input to a conventional system. And I, so I think it's very important that you kind of put this in, in perspective and we hear a lot of the uh, resistance to cover crops in, in some cases about, well, you know, I, I can't, there's an extra expense from seeding the cover crop. And if we're just looking that as 50 pounds more nitrogen or another uh, seed treatment or whatever other additive input that we bring to the operation, that is not the systems type of uh, thinking that we need to do to kind of get to the next uh, fr frontier, so to speak. 
And so I, I, I kind of liken it to this picture of the elephant. And they, you know, a lot of these things get sent around on internet and Facebook things. And I never throw them away because that's material. But, uh, you know, how many, how many legs do you see on this elephant? Well, depending on where you look at it, there's legs sticking out all over the place. And I think that that holds a lot of truth to uh, cover crop management systems. Uh, one, it's not a one-size-fits-all situation, it's not a, a, a silver bullet that we're finding, but it's a matter of putting together a system that works in, in your area, on your particular farm, and sometimes on a field-by-field -field basis, depending on what the particular challenges are that we're, uh, we're facing in those, uh, in those operations. I think another thing that we need to be careful of is to keep considering that you know everything because we're dealing with a switch to no-till or trying to perfect our no-till or interested in cover crops and that type of thing uh, we don't want to get tunnel vision whenever we talk about any of any aspect of our uh, production system we want to keep in mind that all of these things are still vitally important just like they are, always were uh, nitrogen or nutrient management the hybrid and variety selection that we have uh, observations of plant health their stand all of these things are, are important and it's a matter of, of optimizing each piece of the puzzle and putting together that plan that works in your situ situation. I think uh, this is an example here of a, uh, a field that's, that has cereal rye planted on, on one side of it. It's just no-till or uh, had, had not uh, anhydrous put on there. But one of the, and, and one of the problems that, that we see with a lot of the information that comes out about cover crops, it seems that when you read about it in, in well, the, some of the ag press, it's either an interview with somebody to where a cover crop is the end all you know, thing, plant, just go out there and spew a little bit around and that'll answer all your problems, or the next interview or person that you encounter will say, well, cover, I tried cover crops once and it, and it didn't work. And I think it's important then to decide where your source of information comes from. Uh, meetings like this that are focused uh, pretty specifically on soil health and no-till, that's usually a pretty good place to uh, interact with a lot of people that have had various experiences uh, with this type of uh, issue. And, you know, sometimes the information pipeline that we're used to getting production information from, though, uh, it, in, as far as cover crops, from what I've seen and as coming from a university system, uh, isn't always very well suited to uh, practical applications in many cases. One of the things that we've done in, in Illinois, a big project, is with nitrogen management and uh, had plots all around the, the, uh, the state that were replicated in on-farm trials and things. And then they decided, well, this cover crop thing, we need to get a handle on that. So we go out in a, in a uh, conventional system and then we add cover crops to one side of the field, but yet we don't manage the cover crop side as, as a cover crop system. We look at that as, a, as an added input on there. So a lot of the results that we get back from our nitrogen trials and our yield results from that really show that uh, the cover crop system puts us at a, at a negative uh, uh, advantage on, on in many cases. And it, if we look at that at, from a systems approach and if we would manage the cover crop side of the field in a cover crop system, you know, we can balance those things out and get to where we want to be over, over time. So we, as we look at these things, we've got different issues that, that build up, you know, as far as uh, equipment, what, what species of cover crops we want to have on the field, right on down the, the line. But, you know, nutrient management is, import, is very important. And these, these lines that squiggle around here, we won't get real in depth of that. But basically what this is showing is the, nit the, the nitrogen availability in a, in a no cover crop uh, system versus a cover crop. Well, you can see that there's more nitrogen available in that no cover crop system. And this is in a conventional comparison. We put a cover crop on that. Uh, we've got less nitrogen in the system at this time of, of planting and, or, and early crop growth. Uh, that's, that's something that we need to address. You know, it can be a disadvantage if we fail to address that, but if we go into the, the, the development of our system with our eyes open, we have some extra fertility in there early with the, whether it's starter or, or uh, some other type of uh, application to give us that bounce up and we don't go into a, a period of nitrogen deficiency there, you know, there we put our, our system in, on uh, level playing field. Uh, 
you know, a lot of different things that we've looked at about where the, where the nitrogen is held in the field. If we look at, uh, at fall uh, nitrogen application here in, in our part of the, of the world, we can go out there and we can measure. We can see that that nitrogen is truly in the ground. When we've got a cover crop system, you know, some of that nitrogen and a big part of that nitrogen in a lot of cases is going to be held in the cover crop biomass by the time we get to the point where, we, uh, where we're going to plant. So considering, taking those, uh, those aspects into consideration in our management plan is going to be very, very important. Uh, the timing of planting these cover crops and their ability to take up nitrogen and, and, and development and all of those things. So it's not just as simple many times as saying, well, I planted cereal rye as my cover crop. Uh, our, our results from that year in and year out might be a little bit different according to the time of the, the planting date of that cover crop, the season that we had after that. I know in, in our part of the world this year, and I think you know we've had a mild winter across a big part of our, uh, of our region here, we went into the, after our, our harvest was very dry in southern Illinois, so there was a, a, a good chance to plant some cover crops probably a little bit later than we normally would have. And many people stopped planting the cover crops because of the timing of the year uh, where, as it ended up, we had plenty of growing season to get things uh, up, up and running. So if we've got a time, sometimes we can have an early planting of our cover crops, but if we have an early end of the growing season with, the, with cold weather coming in, we're not gonna get that development and so that's going to make for a different result on, of that cover crop at, versus a time when we would have a longer growing season, get more fall development, and then go in. And if we get a time when we have a, an early spring where it warms up, you know, the, the differences in, in the development of the crop when it gets to planting time for our, our corn or soybeans or whatever our summer crop is going to be can be very, very different. So that variability from one, in, one year to the next and the ability to kind of adjust to that uh, year in and year out is where a lot of our, uh, our success lies because we don't want to get stuck in the fact that I do this and this and this and this. We've got to have, maintain some flexibility through the time to really get the good out of the, of the system. And you know, it's, it's neat that uh, I get to go around and uh, work with a lot of fellas that are involved in, in long-term cover crop and no-till systems. And one of the things that sticks in my mind about working with these fellas is, is that uh, I've never met one of them that was into, this, into the system more than five years or so that would ever dream about turning around and cutting cover crops uh, out of their system or, or going back to a tillage environment. But uh, if you, in that one to three year uh, phase right there, some folks get a little bit impatient with that and they turn back before they truly do see the, the results. So that can be a major, uh, major problem. Uh, we've got uh, nutrient management is a huge issue uh, all across uh, the, the country. Uh, we, with our uh, access or, or location in the, uh, the major river system and good drainage through Illinois, uh, we've had a lot of uh, emphasis that was put on nitrogen management over the last few years. And I think all the states that are in, a, in the watershed of the Mississippi River that drains into the, to the Gulf of, of Mexico where the hypoxia issue have been uh, a, a problem lately, have a, some type of a nutrient management plan. And this has been a big part of uh, the studies of a lot of the nitrogen management and fertilizer uh, applications in, in Illinois. Uh, you know, I think that one of the things that we have found with our nutrient loss reduction strategy is that any way you cut it, cover crops appear to be our biggest, excuse me, they, they appear to be how we can get to the goals of reducing uh, nitrogen and phosphorus runoff into our water system uh, as, as fast as anything. And we've got this goal to reduce our contribution in, of nitrogen and phosphorus by 45% by the, by the year 2525. And that's a lot of, uh, that's a big reduction to think about. But we've, we've gone to the point of figuring that if we could get cover crops on a significant 
acreage across the state, that that would be one of the few ways that we could really legitimately have an opportunity to meet those goals. Without that, uh, there, there, without cover crops into the, into the system in a big way, there's probably nothing that we can do as far as split application with nitrogen rates or any of the other uh, inputs or management decisions that we would make that, uh, that would really get us to where we need to be in, in any time of a, uh, a point of time. So change can be challenging. Uh, when we talk about these things, kind of feel like these mouse, they're not in a very good, they're not in a very good place, but I think most of us are, are a little bit better off than that. But I think that, you know, we also remember that the electric light didn't come from continuous improvement of candles. You know, there had to be some point where we put the candles away and we run, a, run an electric cord into the, into the house. So it's kind of the same way with many of these management decisions on taking the leap or, you know, moving in a, in a direction to where we get these, uh, the results that we need because standing our ground and doing the same way that we've always done things isn't going to get us to the results in the long term that we, uh, that we need to financially and uh, environmentally both when we talk about the big picture of, uh, of agriculture across a big part of the, of the Midwest. Uh, another uh, organization that we have working in Illinois on this nutrient management issue and heavily involved in, in uh, the aspects of uh, evaluating cover crops and their impact on the, the farming system is the Illinois Nutrient Research and Education Council and they, they collect a, uh, a fee on every ton of bulk fertilizer that's sold in Illinois. We, we assess 75 cents a ton and that goes into a, a pool that funds a lot of the nutrient management and cover crop work that's related to that in the in the state of Illinois. So if you watch the news, you know, that how many good things have you heard coming out of Illinois in the last couple of years? Well, probably not. Well, NREC is one of the good things, so you can say you've heard heard something. So anyway, but they're, they are, they're a, uh, that's, that money is held outside of state government, and that's the, that's the big, big part of that. Anything that we can do to keep money out of our state government is definitely a, a, a good thing. And, and the point of this is that that money, we know that it's going to stay and be devoted for the purpose that it was, uh, it was collected for. So a lot of work that's been done with this is on-farm uh, nitrogen studies. As it was mentioned in the, in the opening, I'm coordinating these studies in the southern uh, third from about St. Louis south in, uh, in Illinois. We've got replicated nitrogen studies that are going on around the state and some of these we're doing in cover crop systems, some not, to kind of get an idea about different uh, things and as a result of this we get a lot of squiggly lines and, and graphs and things so you can see that as we go through this we can make recommendations at the beginning of the season. The, the yellow uh, the yellow triangles on these graphs is the after the after harvest that's the determined optimum the calculated optimum end rate for that crop well you can see these we've got some lines that are pretty high and lines that are pretty low so a lot of variation across the state and as we make our recommendation it's kind of our best estimate about what a, a sound nitrogen recommendation would be uh, when we get to the end, we can see that it, well, it's kind of somewhere in the, in the middle, but probably not right on for, for everything. So from one year we go and, you know, we take a lot more tests and a lot more tests. But I think that it's good information to have for sure, but it's important uh, for me as I bring, take the program to the southern part of the state to be able to work with some of our producers that are in long-term no-till cover crop systems so we can get an, ac an, an accurate uh, estimate about how, these, how nitrogen response and other factors work in these, uh, in these systems. So I'm looking forward to, to doing that in the next uh, three years as part of this program. Uh, you know, here's a, a field that we, we planted uh, cereal rye after the cover crop, after the uh, corn crop was, was harvested, the numbers there show the different nitrogen rates in there. And you can see the various colorations of the, of the rye crop. So it's, do, it's able to do what it's planted there to do to sequester uh, leftover nitrogen after a corn crop or any type of a crop that would uh, take nitrogen as a, a, as a big uh, input on, on there. So, you know, the, the cover crops are able to do a lot of things in our nutrient management and environmentally 
above and beyond the soil health component that's important to, to all of us. So, you know, as we've seen <coughs> corn yields from back in the 1800s we get here, man, it's really gone up. We've made a lot of uh, improvements and a lot of uh, headway on improving corn yields across the, the country. But, you know, I, I think that many, many of us would think, well, gosh, or to the untrained eye, so we're doing better, so our soils have to be better. Is that right? Well, I don't think anybody in here would, would agree with that. We've been able to get to those higher yield plateaus by the uses of technology and a lot of different inputs and, and systems to bring us a long, long way. But I think, you know, it's amazing to think about where we might be if soil health would have been a primary goal of our agricultural planning along through this time. So, you know, we can think of whatever the big yield for your area is or, or my area, uh, you know, if we had the ability uh, to go back in time and implement a lot of these heavy cover crops and the soil health aspects into our uh, production systems back 50 years ago, you know, would those yields, how high could those yields be? And if they weren't even substantially higher, how much more profitability would be in the system right now because we would have a better handle on our nutrient management. We would be growing the, uh, a lot of the nutrient and having it uh, mineralized naturally or the ability for that would, would be much greater. So a lot of opportunities there moving forward. But I think that you know, it's, we're, we're to the point that we need to start moving in that direction a, as a whole because if we don't, uh, maybe not in, in our lifetimes or the lifetimes of the next generation, but at some point down the line, uh, somebody's going to look back and say, gosh, I wish we'd have done this a little, bit, uh, a little bit sooner. And, you know, for those of you who are in the room and able to participate in uh, observations on your own farm and field days and meetings like this, I think it goes a, goes a long way to move the, move the industry forward. So, you know, as we start to think about uh, our cover crops and where, where we start of putting a plan together that, or a system that, that's going to... Uh, address the needs for your particular farm is important. So, you know, before you think about just going out and, well, let's do some cover crops, we need to have some type of goal or objective for our, our operation or, or that field. What problem or what goal, what problem are we going to address? What goal are we looking to get to at the, at the end? Uh, what's our current tillage uh, and cropping system now? Where are we located? I think that's a, that's a huge thing as far as information goes. We all know the seasonal differences between where we're sitting today and where I'm going to go home to tomorrow. Just seasonally there's a lot of difference. But where your information comes from is, is huge because I, I read a lot of the information that comes out in various uh, farm, farm magazines and a lot of really good results and a lot of compelling stories involved with cover cropping across the, the country. But every time I read one of those articles, I, I see things that, gosh, they, they, that might work good in Ohio or, or wherever the story came from, but I could see ways that that could be done different or things that might not work so well in, in our particular area. So keep our, keep our eyes open for that. But, you know, the drainage of the soils, uh, what's the growing season? Are we looking for a cover crop system to go after a corn or soybean crop? Or are we looking at something that would be planted after a wheat crop to where we have a longer part of the growing season where we could get more aggressive with the, uh, the mix of cover crop species or the addition of, of, uh, of organic matter at, at the end by creating more, more biomass and just a whole, whole uh, number of, of things. Many of the benefits of cover crops uh, we've, we've already heard about today. Excuse me, I eat that big meal, it makes me dry. Could anybody else go for a dilly bar? I'm telling you, after a big meal like that, a dilly bar really hit the spot. <laughs> Not complaining a bit, it was, an excellent, it was an excellent meal, and I do appreciate beef because I'm allergic to, to uh, poultry. So most time I go to about 40 meetings in the wintertime, I have uh, green beans and corns and biscuits, so this was just a great, great place to sit down. But, you know, a lot, of, a lot of things, advantages that we can get, and these have been talked about, uh, erosion control. You know, it's just a no-brainer if we have thing, something green out there growing through the course of the, of the wintertime. Uh, that's going to go a long way to uh, uh, 
slow er erosion, if we've got any problem with leftover nutrients, especially nitrogen in, in the system, we can put together a cover crop program that's very effective in holding that nitrogen in the system and carrying it over for the, for the next year's crop. Uh, the, the soil and organic matter uh, issues are huge. Uh, we get down to you know wildlife habitat and things like that. that. That's one thing that has had a big driving effect in some parts of the southern half of Illinois is that there's a value uh, to white-tailed deer hunting. And many of the uh, producers or the, far the farmers in these areas uh, where the deer hunting is, is involved, they've been some of the, the pioneers and the, the more aggressive folks at looking at cover crops in their particular rotations as a way to increase the habitat for the uh, management of white-tailed deer on their uh, our acreage or the land that they have uh, leased. So, you know, there's a lot of different angles that we can come through this. I know Ducks Unlimited is a sponsor here today. A lot of similar uh, aspects to things in the, in the pothole region with reproduction of ducks and things. So, you know, there's a lot of different things that are involved in this and a lot of benefits that can come out of uh, cover crop <coughs> uh, programs that uh, are above and beyond what comes out in the, uh, you know, in, the, in the grain tank at the end of the year in the combine. So as we look to assess these benefits of, of cover crops, I think it's important to kind of have an idea about the short-term expectations and, and long-term things that are going on in your particular uh, operation. And you know, sometimes I, I, uh, there's a lot of uh, land in Illinois that is cash rented or managed by bank managers from absentee landowners. Uh, and so the, the duration of, the, of your time to farm some of this, this ground might not be long term. So if you're looking at some, something that you might have a, a three or a five year lease versus something that is family owned ground or, or something that you have had a long term agreements with, you can afford to be more aggressive with some of these. Uh, systems, but I think whether or not you know on either side of the of the case there, what, whatever your uh, term of lease might be, there's options to uh, in, involve cover crops in in that uh, system. Long term, I think if we can uh, have a system, an idea about keeping that land, uh, whether it's family land or something that. Uh, is going to be a little bit more long term. You know, the, the, op the options for benefits are far, uh, far and away uh, worth some of the short term uh, challenges for. So, you know, all of these things uh, fit in. Uh, we're going we're to see more uh, long term benefits, and benefits are going to be op uh, realized quicker in a no till system. But we can find, th find some of these uh, options for the guys that are involved in tillage also. So, you know, selecting the right cover crops uh, for, the, for the farm is important, uh, whether it's a mix between grasses and legumes or, or whatever, the uh, brassicas, whatever the, the case might be, the options are, are certainly there. And we've talked about some different uh, species selection today, and I won't get into that real deep. Maybe in, a, in some questions we can, uh, we can answer those, those types of things. Uh, or, or address it with some of the other folks in the room, but I think that you know selecting the right cover crop for the for the job is important. If we are confronting an issue of compaction, or maybe it is salinity, as was uh, discussed uh, the, this morning, there are certain cover crops that can help address those those uh, situations. And if we choose poorly, sometimes we're not going to uh, be able to. Uh, get the benefits that, that we're looking for. So having that plan to put in place right off the bat is, is, uh, is important. I think right off the bat also it's important to look under the soil surface to see what's going on. You know, carry a shovel in the, in the back of the truck, get a backhoe out or something, dig a hole and see what's going on down in your soil so we can actually identify uh, what, what the good and the bad and the ugly, so to speak, about what, what's uh, going on in there. So if we have issues of compaction or you know, whatever that, uh, that might be, put together a plan that we can get to the, uh, the end of that that's gonna get some uh, benefit out of. Moisture management is everything. I know we've had several uh, mentions of that already today. Uh, 
even in, in my neck of the woods where it rains quite a bit, you know, it's usually either feast or famine. We, and uh, this year in, in uh, July, we had something like 19 inches of rain. In August, we had about 17 inches of rain on, on my farm. And in those two months combined, normally, maybe if we'd get seven inches, that would be a lot. So what happens with issues of uh, runoff and things, I, I could see where we could have been in a lot better shape if we would have had more cover crop and more no-till ground on there because we're dealing with feast or famine, one end to the other. So, and cover crops can help us do that by helping us increase the infiltration rates <clears throat> in our soils as well as improving the water holding capacity of those soils so we can we can g gain on both sides of the of the fence right there. I know that <clears throat> in our uh, on our area where people are pushing always to push corn planting earlier uh, you know, it, the soils are slower to dry in, the, in that time of the year but guys want to push, want to push, want to push and what we're seeing is is that for the, the patient no-till cover crop guys that are actually waiting until the ground is ready, they're able to get out in the field and plant a couple days sooner than the conventional till guys, but with one exception, a lot of times the conventional guys will get out there two or three days before it's really fit to go. They'll push it so people will see planters run in a couple of days, but you know what was planted in those first two or three days really isn't, wasn't planted very well. And what we waited to do right in the, in the no-till system, you know, not only have we not had to burn the diesel fuel uh, and, and have some of that uh, intensive, expensive tillage equipment in, involved in the, in the operation, but you know, we've saved in a lot of, in a lot of different ways there. So, but moisture management is key and that goes, that's true whether you have a little bit or a lot or you're trying to plant early and, and all of those things. We also see advantages to moisture management with uh, planting green. Uh, that that growing cover crop is there, and by the time you're it gets to you're getting close to thinking about planting corn, that it's starting to warm up in the spring, and that cover crop it, when it's there and we've got a green cover crop growing in the spring, it's taking up a lot of moisture out of the ground in that case. So that's gonna that's gonna dry the soils and allow us to get in earlier than we might also. So a lot of different things there. We want to kill that cover crop on time. Termination is is huge. I know that we've had some problems with uh, issues with cereal rye. A lot of guys will, cereal rye is a good thing to plant because it's very adaptable. To, you, there's a long window of opportunity to get it planted in, in the fall. It'll do good during the spring and when it kicks off, you know, it'll get, get pretty big. And we'll say, gosh, you know, that's getting, getting awful big, so let's go out there and kill it. Well, that's all fine and dandy, but if you kill that <coughs> and it's, it's pretty good size, uh, that's all going to knock down and what's that's going to do? That's going to keep the sunlight from getting to the ground. It's going to keep the ground wetter, just act like a sponge. So early termination can cause a lot of problems in, in many cases that, that we don't uh, kind of think about if we don't have the right plan put in, in place. Another thing is get, making sure our planter's ready for cover crops. Uh, a lot of the row cleaners and the uh, <coughs> uh, pack wheels and, the, and those types of things on a, on a conventional planter or a, a, a no-till planter. If we're in a no-till system where we're planting without cover crops, a lot of the attachments that are very good at handling last year's crop residue that's dead and loose to move it away from the, from the row area and, and, and make a clean planting environment, a lot of those things that are very effective for that are completely worthless when we talk about getting into an aggressive cover crop situation because we've got things there that are wrapping, we've got parts of the, the, the growing plant that's still attached to the soil versus a corn stalk that's been uh, ground up, you know, run through a corn head and that type of thing. So the differences in planting attachments are, are huge. The press wheels, the various spike configurations and offsets and things, there's a lot of different options there. And also with the amount of residue that we're, we're planting through. So we've got some, some of the settings and configurations that can create problems with extra, extra force and, uh, and different things that would cause a problem in a conventional type of a system. Once we get to a, a no-till cover crop system, those types of things are good because they can help uh, alleviate some of the challenges of those high residues where we've got gauge wheels and pack wheels that are riding up on that residue. We need some extra pressure sometime 
to get in and do a good job of, of uh, obtaining good seed to soil contact and getting that even emergence that, that we need. Uh, one of the big things that gets uh, not considered as much as it should many times is residue distribution. A lot of the problems uh, and challenges that I see with, with the establishment of cover crops, especially if we're in a, in a situation where we're using uh, aerial seeding <coughs> or uh, some other form uh, of uh, even, even plant, even when we drill it in, if we don't have, it, have a good <coughs> uh, even distribution of whatever type of crop was growing in that field, if we've got the strips out in there like this, and this is a, not a real uh, good example, but there, there's a lot, of, a lot of places where it's real evident when we're running 35 and 40 foot heads now that we don't necessarily have the, the spreader attachment, the right spreader attachment on the back where it's not adjusted to get that even distribution across that wide width of, of that header and that can impact things <clears throat> such as the, the cover crop stand establishment, you know, your herbicide I issues, it can create a lot of problems. So at the base, if we can, whatever we can do to get that uh, crop residue uh, distributed evenly, that's going to be a plus that's going to help us in a cover crop system uh, especially. Uh, <clears throat> when we get to the benefits of things, this is a pretty interesting long-term study that uh, Mike Plummer was involved with, uh, with a, a producer that, that we both work with, with now that's uh, in kind of southeast Illinois, but would be pretty close to Evansville, Indiana, if anybody is familiar where, where that is, but on the Illinois side of the, of the river. Long-term, they started in 2000 to 2014. Uh, it was a, a long-term no-till system. Uh, and then uh, cover crops were introduced uh, 15 years ago, and this is continuous corn. We're in an annual ryegrass cover crop, and this is highly eroded, really light timber soils. So <clears throat> we talked, uh, you know, Lance talked uh, earlier about the, the issues in the soil test where you can actually see uh, the in incorporation of cover crops, and you see a negative with those soil health uh, uh, tests, and I think this illustrates that. If we can see the, the red when we get out here, so if we follow the, the red is the cover crop system, the blue is the county average for corn yields across the, this, this county. So we can see here, we started out in, in 2000 with the, uh, with the county average was actually above the, uh, the, a, the average of this field. So we were somewhere in the 100 and, what, 120 to 130 bushel range right there. And as we look to what happened over, over the course of time, we started off with the, uh, in, the, in this cover crop system with annual ryegrass. We see that the yield, you know, the yield trends, bo both systems follow the county yield trends. But as we go down, we get out here to about year three, and the red line magically comes above the blue line. So at that point, the cover crop system had surpassed the, the county average in, the, in this system. And we can see that that maintained that increase all the way out to the end of time to where when we get out here, you know, this is 200 bushels on this line. So this is 230 bushel corn we've got versus 200, uh, no, 100 and figure 170 bushel corn. So we've got a 49 bushel per acre yield increase over the county average by the end, by the end of this study. That's, that's pretty huge. So if we look at this in the short term evaluation, we think, gosh, this is the worst damn thing that I ever could have thought about in the first three years of here. But with the patience to make it through that, you know, I would just about bet you that all of these added as, as the red line is above the blue line out to here, if we would look at the profitability and, or the revenue generated at the very least off of this ground, off of this point, you know, from, from here out to here, the accumulation of that added revenue sure offsets what, what we lost over here. And, you know, this was a bad year out here anyway. So it's just an example of, of the benefits that we can see from this, this long-term uh, utilization of cover crops. So you think, well, how did this happen? And what's going on out there? We've got cover crops that are growing. Well, yeah, was it moisture management, which, which is, or, or what was it? Well, it was all of the above. And I don't know, th this screen doesn't show up near as good as that screen. But if you can look 
Th this is the, at, to the left, we're looking at the beginning of the, of the study. So these so soil cores, these, these first three soil cores here are the, is the soil profile when, when we started, these first three there. So you can see that there's a pretty distinct gray line in there. Everybody see that? that is, this is a, a very dense, fragipan type soil. So what we've got, we've got the top soil in there, uh, just probably about 16 inches, and then we get down and we get into this, it's a gray, real fine, silty layer. And in the, in the summertime, in June, June, July, August, when it dries up, that, that silt sets up like concrete. So it's pretty much an impermeable layer to root development. So what we've got going on at the beginning of the, of the project, the field was pretty much operating at a, at a 16 inch root depth or, or thereabouts. As we move out into the, as the study goes on at the end here, these last four, you can see what happened. We, st we started out with the gray up here. Well, now we've got the gray that's down here. It's not as distinct and even, even oh shoot, get to a good point, hit the wrong button. So, you know, we get out here to this, to this far uh, soil core here, and th these, were, these were all pulled out in the, in the same field. You can see where in, in this, that it, it's faint. It's almost completely done away with that fragipan layer. So in the case, uh, we get out here at the end, instead of having a 16 or 18 inch rooted corn crop, we've got corn, we've got corn roots that are going down 48 inches and below. I, when, they, when they did the final dig on this, they had corn roots that were down 72 inches in the ground. And this, this is not a loose, flat, you know, black glacial till ground that, that should be doing that. That, that is fragipan, hard ground, unglaciated. Uh, so it's, pretty, it's some pretty tough ground, but over time we see this. And that, <clears throat> that comes from the the ability of the roots of that cover crop to penetrate that year after year and as the cover crop roots think about the environment that your cover crop is developing in as the spring season warms up okay it's wet in the in the winter time and that wetness goes all the way down you know we've got wet soils at, uh, and and so when that when that is uh, in the winter time and it's wet you know it it's soft and those roots can penetrate down through. There's no corn roots that are, or bean roots that are growing at that time. Whenever the rye kicks up and grows in the, in the wintertime or the, the spring green up, as those roots penetrate down through that layer year after year, those roots are going to die. And then the corn roots come in and that creates a channel for a corn root to follow that down through that layer. And that after time it, it, uh, it breaks that up. So you, over time, you increase your rooting depth on those soils. So now, instead of having 16 inches of, of, of access to moisture, we've got down to 72 inches. So we've got all, it's moisture management. Remember back a couple slides ago, we've got access to a lot more mineral nutrient uh, availability. We've got more, uh, more water availability. All of this stuff, it's just a good, uh, a good thing. And every situation is going to be a little bit different. But these are the types of long-term benefits that we're really after. And it, you know, you, you're not dealing with the fragipan soil, I, I'm sure, but the issues and the challenges with your soil with the right cover crop plan can no doubt be addressed similarly to this if we get the right plan and stick to it uh, over, over time with the right strategy. Another thing that we look at uh, here, th this just shows, this was in 2012, and I don't know if it was dry here in 2012, but it didn't rain in Illinois, it was terrible. Uh, we had uh, many of the research uh, trials at the, at the U of I farm where I was working there then, uh, we, we took a bush hog to them because there wasn't anything out there to, uh, to harvest. And, and there was thousands of acres of corn in southern Illinois that were destroyed at that time. In the last slide, let's see here, if we go back here, we can see down in 2012 in, in this example, you know, our, our cover crop system was about 30 bushels an acre more. It wasn't a great yield, 
but it's 30 bushels an acre more. And that, I think that's the big thing is that we don't see a lot of times in the best years of the best that the cover crop system is going to give us 30 bushels an acre more than anything else. But in the times of stress, you know, those are when the, when the cover crop system is able to shine because of that, those moisture management issues. So as a risk management tool, you know, that's another reason why uh, cover crops can be a, a valuable tool to our uh, various operations. So just, just real quick here, at different nitrogen rates, and the nitrogen rate in 2012 was immaterial because we didn't have the moisture to drive the yields uh, anyway, but we can see that th this top line here was the annual ryegrass. Uh, we had a uh, different various corn mixes, soybean or radish, different cover crops that are, that are going in here. And then the, lo the last lowest line here, or yield lowest yield, was where there was no cover crop used. And this was not a long-term type of a study. This was done by Beck's uh, seed company. It was a central Illinois trial. So it wasn't a long-term no-till cover crop, but you can see in that year of stress, the, the annual ryegrass and the other cover crops had a definite advantage over the, the lack of cover crops in that, in that situation. Uh, again, our pictures are kind of hard to see, but we can see the, the silt layer just in a no-till system with no cover crop. Over time, we can see some impacts and its improvements in the soil, no doubt. But when we've got the cover crop growing out there and we've got that early development of the, of the roots or, or the impact going into the, the, the fall of the year, when we get some moisture in the ground, many times that can help us to alleviate some of those stratification problems that, that we see. Uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, grazing potential for the, these things too. Uh, if you get a magnifying glass out in your uh, in your handout, th this is one of the things that's on the slide, but one of my uh, counterparts working with one of the uh, community colleges uh, in, in central Illinois did a, uh, a nutrient, an animal nutrient uh, test on the different cover crops. And it's tremendous, tremendous feed value there uh, <clears throat> and, and managed correctly it can really put a, a boost short term on the bottom line and make that cover crop uh, pay off just a no brainer and, and also help to manage that for the maximization of the benefits of that to your, to your soil. So, you know, just a lot of things that are, that are going on there. Another, another benefit that we're seeing out of, uh, out of cover crops is weed suppression. And I, I wouldn't say that by any means that we're eliminating the use of herbicides and moving towards an organic uh, type of a system, but the possibility is, is there, and there, there's some, some people that are doing this, but you know, th this is a, you can see this line through here, and right there, the, the left side of the screen is, is kind of a brown colored dead cover crop. The green side, all of that green that looks, you know, we could tell you it was a nice cover crop blend, but all of that is uh, foxtail and uh, water hemp that, that's coming up right there. And that was the ground, this was ground that was prevented planted last year. This, I took this picture the uh, end of June, and you know, there, there was virtually no weeds had come up on the, on the cover crop side of the, of the field. It was clean, we had the dead cover crop biomass there, but there wasn't any weeds coming through this. And on this side of the field where there wasn't any cover crops, you know, that was a, that was a mess. So basically the far, all the acres that were prevent planted that had the cover crop on, we didn't have to do any management as far as tillage or, we, or, or herbicide control until we planted the, the cover crop into the, into the fall. But all of this other stuff had to, be, had to be sprayed to control the weeds. So just a huge impact that we're seeing with the right system for, uh, for weed suppression in, in cover crops. Uh, on the short term end of that, uh, the clean part of the, of the field there was where a hired man got crazy with a drill and, and drilled cereal rye around the edge of a, of a field, uh, came back in and got, got him stopped, but it was, it was interesting because the rest of the field had this water hemp sticking up that was about head high on me. The only place, and, and that had been, that, all of that had been sprayed with a, a you know, a customary herbicide application, burn down plus, uh, plus something uh, post-emergence.
But you know, af even after the second spray, we've got this mess here. And the only difference is, is that there was cover crop planted where we're, where we're clean on that side. Uh, another thing where we saw last year, uh, <clears throat> we had some, with it being so wet uh, and late planted beans in, in our area, we had some problems with emergence in, the, in some areas uh, <clears throat> where we had some blank spots out in the field. In these cover crop fields, this, this is uh, cereal rye and annual rye grass that was matted down there, planted into. Uh, you know, it virtually kept the fields clean. Uh, there, where the sunlight didn't hit the ground, we had clean. Any place that that was a conventionally tilled field, uh, where we had soil on there, all of the, that whole area would have been water hemp, just as much as you could have got growing in, in there. So, water hemp is a. You got any water hemp up here? Ever hear that? Oh, okay. Well, I, that was good because I've got. I've, I brought up a jug in my suitcase. I was going to sprinkle some out. I didn't want you to go without. Is that that stuff? It's just terrible, but all, all, of our, all of our conventional herbicide programs pretty much do a good job of selecting for that because they kill everything but, and you know, the plant's got the natural ability to adapt and all kinds of good, good advantages going for that, but the more that we do to control other weeds around that, the better that the water hemp does. But water hemp is a sissy when it comes to any type of mulch cover on the ground. It doesn't like the, a little bit of extra cool, it doesn't like the extra moisture. It does best if we've got bare, dry, hot ground. It'll really do good and anything we can do to cover that is, is, is just amazing. But we, you know, we got good results with that and th these are just observations that, that were out around but just a good, uh, a good uh, extra plan to have in your, uh, in your weed control toolbox and there again, putting together a plan for whatever it is in this particular geography on your fields, whatever the challenges might be, the option is out there to move in that direction. Uh, you know, this was a, this was a skip in a, in a corn field. We left a couple rows out so we could walk down here to plots. And I was pretty, pretty hesitant to do this. And this was working with the grower that had the farm with the, with the map or the, the graph I showed just a little bit ago. And uh, Junior has worked with Mike for a long time, and he's a pretty, uh, pretty unique gentleman in, uh, in the fact that he'll try anything. He's a, he, you couldn't ask for a better cooperator to work with from a researcher's standpoint, because if you come up with an idea, uh, you go and sit down at his table at the shop and explain to him what you need and why it makes sense to move that direction, and he'll go build equipment to make it work not only let, let you use the field, so pretty good guy to work with. So he, convinced, he says, ah, he says, don't worry about that. I'll, if, it, if it gets woolly, I'll come back and spray it. Well, again, this is cover crop residue that was just rolled down there, and that, all, that, all that has on it is a Roundup uh, burn down. There's been no, no residual herbicides put on that, that strip right there. So, you know, we get into the challenges. We've talked about some of the, these things already, but, uh, and we'll, we'll move on through this pretty, pretty quick, but, you know, establishment in, in the crop after the row, so, and I know, or after the row crop comes off, having enough of the season after you get your corn or soybean crop harvested to be able to get in the field and drill that in and get the development that you need, especially if it's a crop that's going to be terminated by a, uh, by a freeze. So, you know, we can talk about aerial seeding and those types of things, and I, I know that you've got some of the same challenges that, that we do around here. Uh, anything that we can do to get in the, in the field and drill that in the ground, get that seed to soil contact is probably going to be a benefit, but, you know, there are some different cover crop mixes and some uh, conditions, especially if we can play the weather right, that can open up an opportunity to make use of effective aerial seeding. So we shouldn't rule out anything, just maintain the flexibility to know that some years uh, that's not going to be a good bet at all, and a lot of years it's going to be have quite a bit of risk with it, but we need to keep that, that in mind. So, you know, let's see, we've hit on that. Uh, another thing that, that we find is herbicide carryover problems. Uh, if a farmer calls me and says that they have, they've had problems uh, uh, establishing a, st a stand of cover crops 
especially if they're new cover croppers, nine times out of ten it has something to do with the residual herbicide program that they had on the corn and soybean crop uh, earlier in the, in the season. So we need to look at what the chemistry was because a lot of those uh, heavy duty residual herbicide programs that we have available now to control things like water hemp that will germinate from the beginning of the spring all the way up until harvest, uh, they're also very effective programs at terminating and controlling cover crops. So we need to have the right, the right plan in there. Uh, make sure that we address our time of application. There's a lot of the, uh, the crops that we, we need to have at least a 60 day uh, window between uh, the application of residual and the, and the cover crop seeding. Uh, and if we get into a time of year when we've got a late planted crop and we've got some uh, weed escapes and those types of things, be careful with those late season applications because what you do to clean up a field in the summer can really have a major impact on the establishment of those cover crops as we go into the, to the fall of the year. So most times that, that's something that needs to be uh, addressed. Uh, even when we have a good stand of, of cover crops, uh, many times they're not completely controlled, but we don't get a vigorous stand like, like we would always have. Uh, this shows some herbicide interactions going on here. Uh, you know, we really know that there's a problem there that we would have to look at. And even when we get a good general stand sometimes, there, there has been some type of, of damage to that. So how good, you know, would that, what, how much development has, have we lost in that crop right there? by the herbicide interactions that, that we've got going on there. So if there is a doubt, uh, I would encourage you to go out and, and collect some soil samples in, just off of the top inch or two in, the, uh, in, your, in your growing crop and do a bioassay. You can do it in the shop, put it out, it's warm enough, you know, at that time of the year, you can probably set it out on a picnic table in your, in your backyard. Get some cover crop seeds plant that in there and see what the impact is to your cover crop seeds and if you've got certain species that don't grow well in the pot of soil on your picnic table you probably don't want to put it on the field that you that you harvested out, out of so you know just keep those, those things in mind because that can go a long way to avoid some of the pitfalls that that we see you know we want a good vigorous stand of that and that, you know that's uh, that's hairy vetch right there and maybe not something that that you would get that aggressive with up here but you know hairy vetch kind of grows as a vine and I've seen planters grow through the field with the row cleaners down and you could see the vines pulling from that end of the room to that end of the room the whole field just comes to you so if if you want to if you want to get closer to uh, to God you know you try that <laughs> you'll, it, it'll 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 really come all into into uh, into visions with that so you know We'll look at just a few things here. Some of the, uh, with brassicas especially, if you're using those in, in, your, in your mixes and plans, you know, certain chemistries are going to be more conducive to damage on those, the same way with grasses, so we can see those, those problems uh, picking up. And I'll, just one, one final thing here, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up. With, with this, this producer that, that we worked with, uh, Mike and I have for a, for a long time. He he was interested in some type of a precision planting option to plant cover crops, so he could take advantage of some of the the lighter, uh, less vigorous cover crops that were easier to plant in, and still get benefit out of the more aggressive cover crops that he likes to plant into green. So <clears throat> we put together a, a program with him, and he went into the shop and he built this this is a it looks like mad max but it's a precision cover crop planter this is a two row version it's got boxes that you can plant we can segregate on on certain species that would be on the row seven and a half inches to the side of the row or whatever was dead dead center in the in the middle of the row to establish cover crop plantings like this this is clover and cereal rye and some oats and the oat the the uh, corn crop, the corn row will be in the, in the oat row in, in this case. So when we get to the to planting, we've got these, we've got these open strips here where it's basically a, a, a bio-till type of a thing or you're planting into a, a, just a no cover crop, uh, no-till strip, but you've still got the cover crop there and we know the roots of the cover crops are going in between by the time we get to the end of the year. So, you know, farther on in, into the season, 
Uh, we've got things like that, and they're, you know, long. We've got the cover crop in there real vigorous, but still we've got kind of this strip till, even though that's not been tilled, we've got a good no-till strip in there to where we can get a planter in between that and do a good job of, of planting in. And that's something that we've uh, looked at, and there's several other slides here. We won't go all the way through that, but what was interesting, and it was a hard year in, in our area, and we didn't push top yields by any means. The, the average uh, corn yield around a big part of that area was probably in the 70, 80 bushel uh, range, not, not a very good year at all. But uh, every one of the treatments that we had with this precision planted cover crop system uh, was out yielded the check that was just straight no-till uh, without any cover crops on there by anywhere from 15 to 37 bushels to the acre. So we've got that planted again and looking for that. But you know, just a lot of things that you can play around with to fine tune uh, systems on your particular uh, farm and, and region. So a lot of things that are, that are out there. And with that, I'll turn it back over there. I have really appreciated being here with you today and talking with, with several of you and the, and the rest of the meeting. So it's, I, I hope that you've enjoyed the, the day and have a good, safe uh, cropping season to come.